share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, sir. All right, awesome. All right, let's let's do this. Uh, I couldn't. I could not use um, Zering Zeringen. I I, um, I think is what it's called. I, I couldn't use it for this. It was it was giving me too much trouble, so I just fell back on Keynote. Uh, so um, so yeah. I what, as far as format goes, what I was thinking is um, I would just present kind of the main concepts of the chapter, and then like break up the presentation with actually going through the learning checks. I'm just doing a little bit of live coding through those. Um, so hopefully that sounds useful. Um, that's that's kind of the plan. So let's let's do it. Uh, so um, they open with like kind of the fundamental premise of of data modeling, um, which they say is to make explicit the relationship between an outcome variable, um, also called like a dependent variable or a response variable, and um, an explanatory or predictor variable. And they kind of like zoom in on this explanatory slash predictor variable a little bit and draw a distinction between um, explanatory modeling and predictive modeling. So what they say about explanatory modeling is that it's actually more about quantifying the relationship between X and Y um, and also like determining the significance of any of those relationships um, and, and having you know, measures summarizing these relationships and then possibly identifying any causal relationships between the variables. Um, in contrast, predictive modeling is simpler. Um, you just care about whether you can make good predictions of Y from X. Um, so that's a distinction that they make. And they use um, lung cancer as an, like a, an example to kind of highlight the distinction between these types of models. So um, in the case of lung cancer, if you're um, building an explanatory model, like you might be, you basically you're interested in describing and quantifying the smoking risk factors. Um, and like you might want to do that so that you can design some sort of intervention. So like, for example, um, you know, if, if uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that be for now. Uh, the, the, and then they, they kind of take the same example and talk about what uh, what you'd be doing if you were building a predictive model, and that's a little simpler, which is just like, can we predict whether someone will develop lung cancer? Um, so we're not necessarily interested in quantifying any relationships um, or understanding like the relative size of the risk factors for um, developing lung cancer. <clears throat> so um, that's that's the distinction between explanatory and predictive models. Um, then they jump into kind of a definition of linear regression. Um, and this is just as a quote taken straight from the chapter. So they say, linear regression involves a numerical outcome variable Y and explanatory variables X that are either numerical or categorical. The relationship between Y and X is assumed to be linear. Um, so that's like kind of the broad category of what we're studying here. And then they get more specific and say that basic regression refers to linear regression models with a single explanatory variable X. So that's the topic of this chapter. Um, and they, I, I guess I should have clarified earlier that they're interested in explanatory modeling, not predictive modeling here. So I guess um, to sum up like the topic of the chapter, like we're interested in uh, basic linear regression um, for explanatory modeling. Uh, that's the topic of the chapter. So uh, the first section is covers how we'd handle one numerical explanatory variable. And for that section, they um, take a study from uh, UT Austin. This is a picture of UT Austin. Um, I didn't know what it looked like before I Googled it. Um, it's, that's kind of a neat campus. Uh, anyway, so they took a study from UT Austin uh, about um, whether uh, teaching score is affected by uh, the beauty score of uh, a, a teacher. So um, Y is your outcome variable here, X is your explanatory variable. And they, they wanna know if there's a relationship uh, between beauty and teaching score. So do, do uh, more attractive professors get higher teacher teaching scores? Um, and um, so before they kind of get into doing the linear regression, they say that 
a crucial step uh, before doing any kind of analysis or modeling is performing an exploratory data analysis. And they say that there are three steps to um, exploratory data analysis or EDA. Uh, the first step is looking at raw values and then uh, com computing statistic, uh, summary statistics and then creating data visualizations. And that actually leads us um, to the first learning check. Um, so we'll have an opportunity to do this exploratory data analysis. Um, so what they want us to do is um, conduct a exploratory data analysis with uh, the same outcome variable being score, uh, but with age as the new explanatory value variable x. Um, and, and then there's this kind of follow-up question, what can you say about the relationship between age and teaching scores based on this exploration? So um, I have our studio here. Let's, let's go ahead and walk through um, how we do that. Um, so I've already saved the, uh, can everybody see the code? Is it big enough? Yeah, it looks clear. Okay, awesome. Uh, I've already saved uh, the teacher evaluations in this variable, which is similar to the code they have in the chapter. Um, and so uh, what they like to do for looking at the raw values is uh, use glimpse. Um, so that's what we'll do. <clears throat> and um, this tells us that uh, we're uh, we're looking at a uh, table with four columns, um, the ID, which is just like an identifier for the observation, uh, this, the beauty score, uh, the, or I'm sorry, the teaching score uh, is the second item, and then uh, the beauty average, um, that's the beauty score, and then their age. Uh, so uh, another way that they like to look at raw values is to use um, sample n and just pass in a number of things that we want to look at. So this just grabs five things from the data set. Um, so we can see what some of the values look like. Um, so that completes that step of just looking at raw values. The next thing is to compute some summary statistics. And for that, they like to do, um, they like to use skim. Um, I need to put this in a um, and so we can see, we can see that the skim is actually pretty useful. It gives us uh, the, the columns. Um, we can see that ID is here and we actually are not that interested in ID. Like it's not um, statistically meaningful. It's just, so actually what we should do here is um, select out ID. Type that into skim. Okay. So we can see, um, kind of focusing down here, like there's no missing values, which is great. Um, and then we can see the summary statistics. Um, and these are actually, I put this in the wrong section, but these are univariate um, summary statistics. I'm going to move this down here under this section. <clears throat> and um, it's, you know, they give us the, the mean standard deviation and then uh, basically the, um, the quartiles here with a nice histogram. So we can see how the data is distributed. Uh, the next thing that they uh, like us to do for computing summary statistics is to look at bivariate st uh, statistics. So um, in this case, we want to look at the correlation between uh, the uh, age and the teaching score. So for that, we can just do uh, summarize z and uh, do correlation equals core and uh, score age. Uh, so that's our bivariate um, summary statistic. And we can see that there's a, like a, a weekly negative relationship between uh, the, uh, the age and the, the score. Um, and then the next thing we want to do is create a data visualization. That's the last step of exploratory data analysis. So for that, we will do emails and pipe that into ggplot um, and x is going to be the age, y is going to be the score, and uh, I guess we want to do uh, just a scatter plot here. <clears throat> so that's our data visualization, visualization. I guess we can add a line here if we want, um, which, let's see. Uh, I don't, we don't want that to be smooth. 
I'm blanking offhand on how to. It's the method. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, so method equals L. L. There it is. Um, maybe we dropped this thing there. Okay. Great. Um, so that's looking good for our exploratory data analysis. So let's jump back into the slides. Uh, so that, that line that we just saw, um, they point out that like the, the equation that we're familiar for describing that line of best fit, uh, the, the equation that we're familiar with probably from, um, you know, coming up and, and doing uh, basic math is this y equals mx plus b formula. They like to uh, use a different notation. Um, so y hat um, equals b sub 0 plus b sub 1 times x. Um, basically, they're just switching y for y hat and m for b1. Um, and that, <clears throat> they say that the, the y hat uh, is uh, just a convention for uh, noting that uh, there's a, a fitted value here. Uh, so that's why they like to stick the hat on the y. Uh, great, so when, when you actually fit um, a line, a, a linear model to the data, um, you can actually get, they, they go over how you can actually get a uh, regression table, which looks like this. Uh, and they, in the chapter, they kind of, they break, they break down, you know, what uh, uh, parts of this regression table mean. So uh, more specifically, they focus on this uh, first row and first uh, two columns here. So they talk about the intercept and basically they say that um, it has no practical interpretation since um, observing a beauty average of zero is impossible. Uh, one of the things that they say um, about the beauty average score is that it's from one to 10, I think. And so uh, the intercept uh, value here is, is not relevant. Um, so uh, that's why they say that it has no practical interpretation. The next thing that they look at in the regression table is this um, beauty average. And uh, there's, a, there's an estimate of uh, that coefficient. And the way that they interpret that, uh, this is just a quote here, they say for every increase of one unit in beauty average, there is an associated increase on average of 0.067 units of uh, teacher score. Um, so that's how to how they interpret that um, that coefficient or that that estimate, um, and that that provides us with like kind of how to understand um, what the what the linear regression model is doing, um, and that brings us to the next uh, learning check. So let's do that really quickly. So uh, they want us to fit a simple linear uh, regre um, linear regression and then look at the regression table. So that's easy enough. Um, you can give us the code. And I'm just gonna pipe that into get regression table. Um, so we can see that, um, uh, one thing I should have said is that the learning, the learning checks are using age as the explanatory variable, whereas in the main body of the chapter, they've been using uh, the beauty score. Um, but other than that, like the interpretation is, is basically the same. So there's a intercept value here that um, is not practically meaningful because you can't be zero, you know, years old. I guess you could, but you're not going to be teaching a class. Um, and, uh, and then there's this um, age uh, estimate here, which uh, going back to uh, this verbiage here, uh, basically, this is saying for every increase of, um, you know, one year, uh, there's an associated increase on average of, uh, or associated decrease in this case of 0 0.006 in your, uh, your, uh, your teacher score. So that is that. Okay, so let's look at, let's go back to the slides. Let's go back to... Um, uh, a line of best fit that they draw um, specifically for uh, beauty score and teaching score. Um, they, they start getting into uh, something that they call residuals. And so in order to explain that, they have this uh, visualization. And the, um, 
the this red dot at the uh, upper right of the visualization is the observed value. And then there's a fitted value, um, which is basically a point on the line. And the residual is the distance between those two things. Uh, so that's how they define residuals. And um, they actually show us a, a table of residuals for each of the observations. <clears throat> um, and then after they show us that, they, they basically um, give us a definition of a best fitting line. So they say a best fitting line refers to the line that minimizes the sum of squared residuals out of all possible lines we can draw through the points. So if we go back to this, um, and we'll actually, we'll, we'll, we'll um, see this in detail a little more later, but um, basically this is a best fitting line because um, the, the distance between the fitted values and the observed values, the squared distance rather, um, is, is minimized with this line versus all other lines that we could draw on this plot. Um, and hopefully that'll become a little clearer uh, when we get to the last learning check. By the way, if anybody has any questions or comments, um, feel free to like jump in and, uh, and say whatever. Uh, okay, so that brings us to another learning check. And what they want here is to generate a data frame of residuals um, using the model that we created for the last one. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that in a variable. Whoops, that's not exactly what I want. Okay, and then uh, we want to uh, basically pipe this into get regression points. And now what we have here is this uh, data frame of residuals for the model that we um, fit between age and score. So that's, that's that. Uh, great, so that kind of concludes the section on handling one numerical variable. Uh, next, they move on to uh, explaining how you handle explain, uh, categorical variables. And in order to explain that, they use um, the Gapminder data set and um, uh, as kind of their guiding example. And you can see this is a visualization from the Gapminder uh, uh, website. Um, if you're not familiar with the, the data set, it basically, uh, it's about the uh, wealth gap between uh, nations. Uh, and it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, so right off the bat, they want us to do a, an exploratory data analysis um, with the Gapminder data set. So let's really quickly do that. Um, this should be for you. So uh, we need to look at the raw values. So for that, we can glimpse the data. And we can also do sample n. Um, I guess I should quickly walk through what this glimpse shows. So we have country, continent, year, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita. Um, and great, and we also already looked at some of the raw values here. All right, so let's compute some summary statistics, which we can do with skim. Um, it's pretty neat. We can see we don't have any missing values, which is nice. And we have some histograms of some of these, some of these, uh, these columns here. And, oh, this actually goes under the variant. Um, there's not bivariate summary statistic here because we're dealing with categorical data. So we're gonna do, uh, let's just end this with a visualization. So for that, we'll do continent on the x-axis and GDP axis. And for this, I'm just going to do a box plot. Uh, but we could also do, oops, they and they go over this, but you could also do a, um, a, uh, 
acid wrap by concentrate. And this would actually be okay. Um, oh, whoops. Oh, that didn't look right. Uh, oh, facet grid, facet grid. That also doesn't look right. I have to look at the docs real quick. Would be Jim Barley, right? Oh, we actually want a histogram. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So that's good. So we can see the distributions of the data by continent. Um, in 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 both of these in both of these plots, uh, one with the facet map and one with the the uh, box plot. All right. So um, the next thing that they point out is that uh, for hey hey Matt, I have a question. Sure. So. So on the box plot, we can also actually sort of see the distribution, right? Like, so if you go back yep. there, like uh, the reason I say that is because I, I really like box plots a lot. And so um, I think, uh, so like, would it be uh, a valuable exercise to actually see what's being represented by the different lines there and why some of them are more spread out than the others in terms of the variance, et cetera? So wouldn't, would you think that would be a good exercise, like just to uh, like talk about the, the way the points are distributed on this plot? Sure, yeah, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, actually, if you want, you're, you're welcome to explain it, um, but I can also talk about it too. Okay, uh, well, I, I can jump in a little bit. And some, so I'm sure everyone knows that the line in the middle is actually the medium. So the good thing about the, the box plot is that you're looking at the medium and not the mean. And so you don't have as much of a skew as you would if, if you had a lot of outliers in your data. So that's one of probably the primary strengths of this plot. And, um, and then what you see at the lower line is your 25th percentile or quartile. And then the, um, the upper line is your 75th. And uh, outside of that, the whiskers basically represent your, the extent of your data. So I think it's like 1.5 one, one and a half times uh, standard deviation or something to that effect, am I right? Yeah, I think that's right. Either the standard deviation or the interquartile range, I can't remember. Yeah, oh, I think you're right. Interquartile range, 1.5, yeah. That, that is correct, you're right. It is, uh, it is 1.5 times IQ. Like so I've always had a question and I think I got the answer, but looking at this, um, are we seeing anything like an outlier which falls outside that range? And if there is anything, how do you actually identify that? looking at this would that be outside the whisker like those dots which come outside of that would they be considered the outliers exactly yes um yep yeah gotcha. typically with um gdp or any kind of man-made system that produces a variable you want to uh, re-express it like if you put this on like a log 10 right you'll have less outliers and you'll see more of a separation between the groups that's a good yeah. point, actually. Yeah, that's a, good that's a very good point. We can do that. Um, yep, I do think that's a great idea. There we go. Yeah, that's nice. a good idea. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, so it's cool. easier uh, to see the, the differences there. And I think if the median is tilted more towards the top versus like being right in the middle or lower, it gives you some idea about the kind of skew, isn't it? If it's like a left, uh, if, if, if you're, if it's left, it's, it's skewed towards the left or if it's skewed towards the right. Is that correct? Yeah, that's uh, how I interpret it. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so I don't know, like the tails, I guess would, it would, um, I don't know this and I don't want to say something, but it might be, it might be something that I could, uh, we could research um, the, the position of the median and, um, and exactly how much 
uh, is there to the top and the bottom of it is I think um, you could also actually superimpose a distribution on this. Like I think they have, I don't know what those plots are called, but it actually comes with a distribution as opposed to just this. So that's also a neat way to actually see how your data is distributed and also see the other uh, things that a box plot offers. Oh, um, yeah, I wonder if that's, if that's from the GG Ali package, or uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but there's a, there's a nice package that, that will do box plots and also the, the histograms all in one. It's, it's, it's actually really nice. Um, I think, actually, I might have it installed. Yeah, here it is. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try and use it. Um, because I haven't, I haven't really messed with it, but, but yeah, I think you're right. There's a way to get both. Uh, all right. Well, if that's all the questions and comments we had on this, then I guess we can jump back into the slides. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay, so they, after talking a little bit about categorical variables, um, they, they say that um, the model doesn't yield a best fitting line uh, like before, like, um, like we saw for a numerical variable, um, but rather they're, they're offsets relative to a baseline for comparison. So um, they, they basically show this with, with this line of code here. Uh, and they're, they're creating a, a linear model for um, life expectancy based on the continent. And uh, when they, when they, uh oh, it says we're running out of time. Uh, but running out of time, we remove the 40 minute time limit. That's awesome. Uh, okay, we can keep going. So uh, when, they, when they run this code, they get this, uh, this regression table. And uh, basically, what they say is that this intercept is. Uh, the estimate of life expectancy for Africa. And that's the baseline um, for, for comparison. And um, so when you look at the next term, uh, the way to read this is uh, it's saying that the, um, the estimate for uh, the Americas is going to be 54.8 plus 18.8 uh, because the, the intercept is the baseline and um, this is the offset from that. So uh, you're going to see that the, uh, basically the, the life expectancy for the Americas is, uh, is whatever, whatever that is, uh, a 72-ish, uh, 73. Uh, so that's kind of how to interpret uh, the regression table there and, and what those things mean. Um, and that brings us to another learning check. Uh, so they, they, they basically, they want us to do the same thing that they just did, uh, that I just showed, but instead of life expectancy to, to fit a model um, where the uh, outcome variable is GDP per capita. And uh, so we will we'll do that. Uh, okay, so they actually were only interested in the Gapminder data from 2007. So let's really quickly hit that filter. Okay, so we've got our linear model, and I'm just going to pipe that into Git. Okay, great. So um, so there's our regression table and they, they ask us like, how do the regression results match up with the results from the previous exploratory data analysis? So this is nice because we have the, uh, the visualization right here and we can see that the intercept, um, is the baseline for comparison, which is Africa. And that makes sense because it has, it has the lowest, uh, median GDP per capita here. And, um, unfortunately these things are out of order. We could fix that, but, um, we can see that the Americas are next, um, and you know there's the, the, again the way to interpret that is it's a, it's an offset from 
from this, uh, uh, this baseline here for Africa. Uh, and we can see that, yeah, that kind of makes sense with how this is. It's a little harder to see because it's on the log scale here, but um, we add these things together that, that kind of makes sense. It's like close to, to here. <clears throat> um, and so on and so forth for, for the other continents. I'm not gonna, not gonna get in the details there unless, unless somebody thinks it's useful. Um, but that's, yeah, that, I guess that answers that learning check. Yeah, one of the big um, things I like to look at is any overlap in those confidence intervals, because then you can kind of get an idea of where the separation occurs between the different continents. Sure. I always find that you see the range. Because like your, your max for Africa is at 58, and you got Europe way above that at their lowest. So Europe and Oceania are definitely um, very different across the board. Yeah, good point. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Huh. All right. Anything else before we jump back into the slides? All right. Keep on chugging along. Uh, okay, so now the next thing has to do with uh, the residuals. We already know about residuals. Um, so what we can do is basically they want us to look at the residuals for the model and find the five countries with the um, five smallest residuals. And um, so let's do that first and then we'll look at the follow up question. So I'm going to save this. Um, as and oh wait, sorry about that. Got something in the way. There we go. So ones. Okay, uh, so let's do PDP per cap and let's put that into get uh, regression points. So we can see our residuals and we need to give it an, I think there's an ID that we need to specify, which is the country. Yep, okay, so now we can see the countries with the most negative residuals. Um, so this is, the way to interpret that is, um, and someone correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, the countries where the model uh, most um, overestimates uh, the GDP per capita based on the continent. And so in order to do that, we're just going to use a range and uh, by the residual. Uh, oh, wait most negative residuals, so there we go. Uh, okay, so so yeah, Albania, uh, Bosnia, Turkey, um, th so these are these are some of them with the, you know, the most negative residuals, and the way that I interpret this is that these are countries that are much uh, poorer than we would expect given that they're in, con uh, the, given that they're in Europe. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I interpret that. Um, so these are, these are kind of the poorer countries in the in the continents, which is interesting. And the next so I check. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, well, doesn't the residual also indicate like the fit? So like I mm -hmm. think isn't the residual calculated by the fitted word minus the estimate or? Um, I'm not sure if it's square. Obviously, it's not squared because you can see the bias. I mean, like if it's negative or positive. But I think the higher the, that difference, does it also indicate um, poorness of fit? Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. It, it does indicate a, a worse fit. Um, yeah, the, the model, yeah, the, the, the model is doing particularly badly on these countries within Europe. Um, yeah, I think I think that's right. Okay, cool. And yeah, yeah, that, that's actually a good point. It's the residuals. 
it's not squared, which is surprising because, oh, okay, it actually doesn't necessarily have to be squared. The residual can be well, positive yeah. or negative. It's just the, the, when they talk about the best fitting line, it's the sum of the squared residuals. That's correct. So I think this is um, generally when you don't remove a sign, that means you don't want to lose the bias. So like basically you right. want to see if it's biased in the positive or in the negative direction. But if you didn't do that with your fit, with your goodness of fit uh, line, then you would basically cancel each other out. So yeah, that's correct. Okay, good. Awesome. Yeah, that's uh, very similar to just taking like an average. For, so if you have like your Y and you take the average of the Y and then you subtract the Y from the average or the average from the Y, you get your residuals from the average, right? So with linear models, it's like averages on steroids because you're not looking at just the Y itself. You're looking at other variables and then getting a average value. And then you're comparing the Y to that average value, but based on other variables. So you can treat it exactly the same as you would a, uh, as an average. Like the like they, when they do the variance, it's the same process. When they do the standard deviation, they don't call it a standard deviation, um, but it's all the same math. I see. That's helpful. Thank you for pointing that out. Both of you. So, if I'm okay. understanding this correct, does it mean that the the mean is a reflection of all the explanatory variables that went into it, but then the y hat for that particular parameter that's being evaluated is only looking at that parameter's influence. Is that correct or am I just completely getting it wrong? Yeah, so like your average from the, 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 the Y, right? So your average Y, so like if you just took like either the overall, um, what are we looking at? Uh, GDP, GDP, right? Yeah. Took your average GDP and then you took your, um, observe GDP minus that average, and then you took the variance of that, that's gonna be like your baseline. And then when you use a, a, uh, another explanatory variable, you're gonna take the variance of that compared to the variance you'd get just looking at the average. And that's your, um, and then that, that actually is where you get like your um, R squared from. So the difference between the variances is, is ultimately where you get your R squared. And that's like how much of the variance is explained by including this additional explanatory variable. Oh, wow, that, that is an amazing explanation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here all night, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is helpful. That, that, the R squared stuff is actually something that they didn't really get into in this chapter or like I feel like at all in the book. Um, do you have any recommended resources for like kind of following up on on the, the explanation that you gave, which I appreciate? Um, good resources. I mean, it's it's effectively the correlation squared. Okay. Or it's actually the square root of the. Um, no, it is the correlation squared. R squared is the correlation because R is the correlation. So when we did that negative ten, if you if you squared it, you'd get the um, R squared. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know about a good resource. What would be a good? I have to. I can look. I have. Well, uh, no worries. No, I actually, actually okay. if you don't know offhand, that's okay. Well, I. You know what? I just someone recently submitted a thesis, but that person actually had um, um, had what well, exactly what um was it Eric that just spoke? Yeah, I'm Eric. Yeah, so he had exactly what Eric said, but obviously, like it's in a book chapter. So I'm gonna I'm gonna drop it in the Slack channel once we get off this, but. Thank you for reminding me of that. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Uh, so the next learning check is uh, very similar. Like we just want to find the countries with the five largest positive residuals. So uh, so here we are. Uh, I, I just threw a negative in front of uh, the residual in a range, and that sorts it the other way. Uh, so. Uh, we see we have Kuwait, uh, Singapore, United States, um, and I guess so. The interpretation here is that the model is um, is is underestimating uh, the GDP per capita for these countries. Um, so basically, these countries are um, very rich relative to other countries in the continent, um, which that 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 tracks with like 
my limited understanding of uh, of uh, of these of these countries and their wealth. Uh, okay, and I think there's only one more learning check, which gets us into some of the residual stuff again. So uh, they they're just trying to help us solidify our understanding of uh, the best fitting line. So they say note in figure 5.13, there are three points marked with dots. Um, the, the, the best fitting line is in blue. There's an arbitrary chosen uh, dotted red line and an arbitrary chosen uh, dashed green line. They want us to compute the sum of squared residuals by hand for each line and show that of these three lines, the, the regression line in blue has the smallest value. So here's the figure. Um, I, don't, I don't know how useful it is for us to actually go through this um, by hand, but uh, but that's that's the exercise, and I think it's like pretty intuitive. I think that the the residuals are going to be smallest for the for the blue line versus the um, the red or the green line. But if we, we I'm happy to go through it, walk through it if if people think it's useful. All right, um, and that's that's all I have. Those are all the slides. So that, that takes us through um, chapter five. Excellent presentation, Matt. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad, glad you thought it was useful. Um, I feel like, so if you have any um, constructive feedback, I'm happy to hear it I, as far as how it's formatted. I do think that I presented, it was a little long. Um, like I think what we said in the first meeting is that we want to aim for uh, the guideline was like 20 to 30 minutes for the presentation and then give more time for discussion, but we kind of interwove the discussion in. So I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? What, was that um, a helpful format or should we try and do something different next time? I like this format, but that's just. Yeah, it flowed really nice. All right. Awesome. Well, do we want to, I mean, we have another uh, 15 minutes roughly. Is, is there anything we wanted to talk about that I, did, that I didn't cover? Well, there's, um, so I remember when uh, I was going through this and there was that uh, learning check 5.2. And this, is, this will reinforce like the intuition that linear regression is basically averages on steroids. Because um, you're getting an average value for, for your y just based on other values. Because if you look at um, a linear model um, predicting um, score on age, and you actually go in and then um, to look at the marginal increase in score based on one additional year in age, by the time you get to your average um, score, you're right there around the average age. Oh, are you looking at the, sorry, are you, are you looking at the line? No, nah, so did you do the, on, maybe, did we not do the model? For the we did do, the, yeah, we did, we did the model, it's right here, and then here's the regression table. So if you, yeah, so if you look at that, so you're getting like 0 .006 uh, in, in an increase in score, or decrease in score for every year of age, mm -hmm. and by the time, and, by the time you get up to um, like 41 years old, I think it is, like you're right there around, like once you're at the average age, you're right around the, um, the beauty score, the average beauty the, score. The average beauty score? Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you look at the summary table um, for beauty score, uh -huh. I think it's like 4.17, I think it is, something like that. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Yeah, so if you just kind of do the, um, using the, you know, because well, there's a marginal increase in score for every um, year of age, it's just fascinating how it lines up. Because it really is just uh, an average. Interesting. Huh. So, you start out with minus 0 0.06, yeah? And then the beauty average is, what is it, 4.16, was it? Um, let's see. 4.4. Okay, and so how do you interpret that, Eric, looking at the regression table for the model on 5.2? 
Yeah, so if you take, let's see how, what, how do I think about this? So I, you have your uh, marginal increase, right? So it's that uh, 0, 0, 006, negative 0, 0, 006. And if you divide that, the intuition struck me. What was it? Because this is actually where like it all kind of dawned on me when I was working through this. So if you take the marginal increase divided by, or the marginal decrease in this case, divided by the, um, now that I'm on the spot, I won't be able to remember. No worries. No, no, take your time. There is an intuition here. Okay, I'm gonna figure it out since I, I opened my big mouth. <laughs> no, I think it's great. You take the marginal I score. I didn't pick up on it all, so. One second. I'm jumping into ours so I can actually look at my uh, notes. Yeah, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, I can do that. All right. uh, I think, yeah, yeah, I think you should. You may have to enable it. Oh, uh, how does one? Hey, how do you zoom? Let's see here. Does anybody know how to do this? Allow somebody to share? I think there might be like um, ellipses underneath my name and you can, or by my name and then you can change the status. Yeah, I see allow record, but I don't see allow screen share. There's nothing about that. Ask to start video, that's not it. Interesting. Oh, Hey. <laughs> yeah, I don't uh I don't see an option. There's an allow record option, but I'm recording. I don't really want you recording too. No, I don't record again. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe only the host can share their screen in the free version of Zoom. Maybe that's what we're gonna do. I, I've lost the uh, thread though, I don't remember. That's okay, maybe no you can put the Slack channel after. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's we need to think about that though, because if you, yeah, it is about, it, it is the, co it is using the coefficient. And I remember I was, I was having this moment where I was exploring it and I was like, because I, I, I wanted to do the effect size, because I wanted to just see what the effect size was. You know, and the intuition made sense at the time. Um, no, that's great. Please drop your thoughts in there and we'll be happy to jump in. Good. All right, guys. Appreciate it. I remember. I remember. Well, it was great, you guys. I'm going to have to jump off, but thank you so much. And let's continue the discussion in the, in the group. Okay. Sounds good. It was nice. Have a good night. Have a good night, night everybody.